tonight is about Western State. They asked me to speak about Western State Hospital. Um, and so my company, and let me, if you, if you want, because everybody probably said Lot's Wife, what does that mean? Why are they called Lot's Wife Publishing? Is that like turning into a pillar of salt? Um, <laughs> so I'll just explain that and get that out of the way. Um, because Lot's Wife Publishing also did the Hope Reborn of War book. And in addition to the Wilson, uh, the Western State Museum panels and, and other things. Um, back in the early 90s, I was the research historian at the Frontier Culture Museum. And I had several colleagues there. One was Dr. Catherine Brown um, and, and also uh, Sue Simmons, who went through the JMU public history program as well. And we all had worked various times at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library at the Frontier Culture Museum, um, had taught, and and our, our lives kept interacting. And we, we said, I wonder if there's something, some way to make a living with history and not work at a museum or teach, um, which we were doing all of that. And so we thought we'd form this little history publishing company. Uh, the jury is still out on whether you can actually make a living at it, <laughs> separate from doing those other things, but you can kind of combine it. And so we we said, yeah, let's do a little history publishing company. We can write history books. Sounds pretty easy, right? Um, so um, I had been doing some freelance work for um, a, a local historic preservation firm, and they had contracted with me to to do the a historic building survey of Trinity Episcopal Church, which is was approaching its 250th anniversary in Stanton. And um, it was the local government church when during the colonial period. And so I did that. And then they said to me, would you like to turn, you know, what you've done, which is about 100 pages of, of research and writing into a book? And I said, sure. And I know just the company to do it. <laughs> and that was our sort of company that we were thinking about. So we had to rush out and go to a lawyer form a company and um, to publish this book. And um, and the lawyer said, you know, start drawing up the partnership agreement. And he said, well, what's the name of your company? And we're like, I don't know. We hadn't really thought about that. Um, and so we said, we'll get back to you. So so um, we came up with history publishing, Shenandoah publishing, boring, all boring that no one's ever going to ask about. And then um, there were three of us. And one, Sue Simmons said, well, what about Lot's Wife Publishing? And we're like, what? And she said, well, think about it. Um, in the Bible, if you're familiar with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, not really good, happy places, um, God said, you know, to Lot and his family, you got to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah and not look back, right? So they, they did what God said. They left. But what did his wife do? She turned around and looked back. She did turn into a pillar of salt. But that's not the key point here. The key point is we figure she must be, we were all three women historians. She must be the first documented female historian because she had to look back. So, <laughs> so um, there's no, um, we scoured the Bible and there's no name. So she has to be the, the wife of Lot. And so that's, that's how we got our name. So we rushed off to Trinity Episcopal Church, said, we'll, we'll draw up a contract for you. And what's the name of your company? And they were like, Lot's Wife Publishing for a Church History. Um, like you're talking about the Sodom and Gomorrah place, right? <laughs> and we're like, hey, just, just go with it. And um, and it and it's and they did, thank goodness. And they're not the last his church history. We've done probably 15 or 20 church histories. And so we always start off when we meet with the the church history committee, we always start off with that story to let them know that it's all right. It's gonna be all right. So that thought I'd get that out of the way so you wouldn't be you know thinking about that and not paying attention to the talk tonight. Uh, <laughs> which is called Finding Asylum, Two Centuries of, of Mental Health Medicine at Western State Hospital. It's really Western State Hospital is really an interesting story, and it's a story of sort of uh ups and downs of 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 mental health history. And and it's a in this sort of encapsulated the history of the Shenandoah Valley too and, and the history of, of Virginia. Um so let's see if we can make this work. Um, so first, let's just kind of address a couple of words to get that out of the way, because some of those words that we're going to use have bad connotations now, and they didn't then. Um, the one is asylum. Um, and asylum, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's a place of refuge. It's a place where you go, like, like if you go 
if there's a war going on, you can go into a, a church and seek asylum. It's a place to be protected and, and keep from getting you know, caught in the crossfire. Um, and today we think of an insane asylum as just a, a really bad, terrible place. And it wasn't. And, and so we have, you know, over the centuries have changed in our mind what, you know, asylum means. And just to give you a case in point, there's an elementary school kind of close to the original Western State campus, which is on Route 11, Greenville Avenue in Stanton. Mm -hmm. Across from Wright's Dairy, right, if anybody knows where that is in Stanton. Um, and it's Bessie Weller Elementary School, and it's up in there. And they have a creek that goes through their property, um, and they're putting a little nature trail in there. And the creek, and they're, they're, they're restoring all the invasive plants and putting a nice little nature trail. And the people doing it bemoaned to me the fact that it was called Asylum Creek and, and how terrible that was. And I said, that's no, that's actually, that means it's a place of refuge, you know, a place for the students to go and kind of refresh themselves in nature. And, and it's a good chance to give them a little history because that's the creek that flows past Western State, the original Western State Hospital. So that's one word. And the other is lunatic. Um, and now we, lunatic is a really, you know, he's driving like a lunatic. Um, but but back then, lunatic was just a way we would describe somebody who had some kind of of mental incapacity, um, and it was and it was just a, a legal word that that was used. So just to know that those two words, because when when this hospital was started, it was called Western Lunatic Asylum, um, and that and and that has did not have negative connotations. In fact, as you'll see, it had 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 amazingly positive connotations. <clears throat> so in the beginning is 1825, um, and this is actually the and it's a state institution. So it really was really the first state institution that that sort of set, set the Stanton area up for for a lot of these state institutions. And and the 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 Stanton Augusta County area has become known as you saw from the Hope Reborn of War. And um, I think did Bill Miller talk about? BSDB and the hospital during the Civil War. So all these hospitals, you know, some places like Waynesboro, Virginia, are known for industry, but in the Stanton area, we're, we're known for hospitals and and places of of medicine and healing and 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 rest. So that that's very interesting. And BSDB, um, it was a next door neighbor to it. Was, just came a few years later, Virginia School for the Deaf and the Blind, um, and both of those are state state institutions. So the Virginia General Assembly created in 1825, um, and they needed to do that <clears throat> because um, Eastern State Hospital in Williamsburg, um, which was is the oldest mental institution in the, in the United States that was established, was established in 1773. Um, it was it was overflowing. And Virginia, this is this is many years before the Civil War. So Virginia included all of West Virginia. So if you were if you were living in in Charleston, West Virginia, and you had uh, a family member who needed to be hospitalized because of a mental illness, um, you had to get them all the way to Williamsburg. That was that was an incredible hardship. So the General Assembly said we need to have something that's that is halfway um, across Virginia. And so Stanton became sort of the you know, now it's in the western part of Virginia, but Stanton became the middle point, midpoint of this huge state. And so it was west of Eastern state. So that's how I got that. But interestingly enough, during the Civil War, <clears throat> when West Virginia had broken off in 1863, West Virginia broke off from Virginia um, and they established their own hospital in West Virginia. Then during the Civil War period, then Western State Hospital became known as Central hospital because because it was in the middle of the state but um but then it went back to western state after west virginia left so um just a little bit of trivia if you ever get into a party situation and have to <laughs> um so western lunatic asylum was established in 1825 um and it was the fifth in the nation and and the main building the first building of western state is now um it's now the blackburn inn um but it is now considered the oldest surviving building built for for um, mental health in the in the entire United States. So it's, it's very historic. Um, 1825 is an important year for the building of Western State. And 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 this is why in in um, over in Charlottesville, 
they had just finished building um, a university that they picked <laughs> as Charlottesville being the middle of the state of Virginia, the central part. And all those, they'd been, they geared up, all the carpenters were there, all the people making the thousands of bricks and all the architects were just beginning to be almost out of work. So all they had to do was pop over the mountain and the architects that did Western State and the brick, the brick masons and the brick makers and the carpenters all just kind of did their training at UVA and then they perfected it over at Western State. Um, so the first arc, so they, 1825, and then a local committee was formed a local committee was formed that had to um, oversee the building, the acquisition of land, and they picked four acres of land um, out just in the county, just outside of Stanton, um, basically where right across the street from Wright's Dairy, right? Um, they got, it started as four acres, and they hired an architect. Um, his name was William Small, and he lived in Baltimore, and he had done some work at the University of Virginia, but uh, he, he'd done a lot more in Baltimore, and his claim to fame was he was a student of Benjamin Latrobe, the guy who designed the U.S. Capitol. So it was, but they told him, the, the Stantonians who were on the committee said, you need to make it very, um, you know, plain and Republican, uh, basically saying, um, you know, keep it simple. Uh, we don't want to spend a lot of money, but it has to be nice and sturdy. So he started, the, a lot of those people came over from, from uh, UVA. And then, let's see, so in March of 1825, UVA was had is, is finished. His first students came in April of 1825. The General Assembly created uh, Western State, and so they were like immediately popping over the mountain. And so <clears throat> that was the beginning. And it took them three years to to build it. They had to hire a superintendent. Um, the first superintendent was Dr. Boys B O Y S, and he was, you know, he he didn't really make any waves in history. He's just a name and and became the over the, the person overseeing it. He was uh superseded in in the one that came right after that we'll talk a lot about. Um but but he got it started and um and he was there for, for a couple of years. The superintendent is the most important person at Western State because he's it would be a physician and he was in charge of all the the medical outlook on the, the hospital but also all the administration. And he's the one that has to report right back to the General Assembly and make sure that that they're not going in debt and and that, you know, the, the PR is good. And so so it's a it's a pretty stressful and, and big job. Um, so boys was there. And then. Um, so and then another architect came just a couple years after boys and at the same time as the second the second guy, Francis Stribling, Dr. Francis Stribling came and his name was uh, Blackburn. And um, and Blackburn um, was Thomas Jefferson's one of his main architects and one of the main architects at UVA. So you see, if you look at UVA's old buildings, you and you look at Western states, you can see that they were done by the same the same people and the, the same designs, and it's the same architectural time period too. They're they're you know almost identical. But so Blackburn stayed on. Small was only really was responsible for one building and his drawings. Um, not all of his drawings actually came to fruition, um, but then then Stribling and Blackburn hooked up, and now of course, what is what is the the Inn and Conference Center called? It's the Blackburn Inn, named after that that famous that more famous architect. Um, so he and and Francis Stribling that we're going to talk about teamed up, and they designed a building that was supposed to be a place of asylum a place where you could come and refresh yourself. And they, they designed it to never have more than 420 patients. And as you'll see, that that changed radically over the years. Um, here's some of the designs from it. Um, and you can see the the cross on the on the left, there on the left, um, it was supposed to be so you had you had men and women who were at different places and then you had you had patients who uh, were more no noisy, and in fact, in in the twentieth century, Western State they called it the noisy house because it was patients who who made a lot of noise and were disruptive, and so they just kind of were put to themselves. And so, so here you have that, and and some more pictures here. the The blue piece of paper down at the bottom 
there are literally hundreds of thousands of bricks at Western State Hospital. They they set up a brick making yard right there, and um, and this is just an order for just just seventy thousand bricks. Is, is that one? So, um, and this is the first the first known drawing of Western State in 1838. So it had been open about about ten years at this point. So um, the the iron fence that you see around it now didn't come until about the 1850s, and again that was that was Blackburn's idea to put that iron fence up there. Um, so the first building opened on July 24th, 1828. That was the the main big building. Um, the next day, the first patient came, and it was a a guy named Anderson Kendall. He was a school teacher from Orange Orange County, and he was admitted for excessive study. Um, <laughs> so he actually um, <laughs> he actually stayed there. Uh, I, he he never he found a home there, a place of solitude, but he never left. He he's uh, he's buried. Well, I don't I don't know that he's buried there, but he died there, um, and we know that because. I'll show you a picture of the register. And then that afternoon, um, a second guy came and he was admitted for religious excitement. <laughs> and then two ladies came the next day. So in, in two days after the building opened, there were four patients. And by 1835, so seven years later, there were 35 patients, 18 men and 18 women. Um, so this is that patient register. You, it's hard to read here, but you can actually read it pretty well. And every patient whoever came into Western State, um, at least in those early years before before we had HIPAA stuff that closes all the records. But these these early records, it's a big ledger, folds out about this big, and big long pages, and it has the name of the person, like where they were from, their age, kind of what they were admitted for, and then what happened. And some will say, you know, died of pneumonia or released, went home, cured. Um, and, and so it, it's an amazing record. Um, is that online? That is not online. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's no, it's not online. Um, we're working on something with Augusta County Historical Society to try to. We've got a Augusta Community Portal, and that sets some of the records that we'd like to. Some of those old records that are available to to try to scan them and have them online for people, because a lot of people are looking for relatives who um, you know who were at Western State. We'll talk a little bit later about the cemetery that's there, um, because. Because a lot of there, there are over three thousand graves there of people who were buried there. So I thought there, there's a huge long list of reasons people were admitted, and it, and it included it included physical things like epileptics. There was no there's no known understanding in the 19th century of what caused epilepsy um, or how to how to control it. And so epileptics wound up at you know in the in the mental institutions um, and other other diseases as well. So Here's just a few. I mean, I've got a, a list um, that is like this long of different things, but religious excitement, heart study, gold fever, epilepsy, blow on the head, uh, domestic trouble, mm -hmm. disappointed love, sexual derangement, inhaling tobacco fumes, exposure to cold, loss of a lawsuit, <laughs> fright, intemperance. There was a lot of, of alcohol or or some like opium abuse um, that one had people there. Close close reading of the Bible. I don't know what that <laughs> childbearing, immoral life, uh, grief, menopause, uh, loss of money, and then one was admitted for money, cigarettes, and whiskey. So we quickly get to the most important period I, in my mind of Western State Hospital that really set the grounds for everything. And that was the second superintendent that came in 1836. So um, just just eight years after Western State opened. He was only 26 years old when he um, when he was made the head of this. So this, that's an important, stressful position to put someone in at that age. But he was he was, um, you know, a very um, Smart man and very uh, humane man. He was the he was from Augusta County, and he was the first student to graduate from the University of Virginia Medical College. And then after he graduated from there, he went up to Pennsylvania to the Pennsylvania Medical School and and did more training up there. And when he was up in Pennsylvania, 
he had the opportunity to see a lot of poor houses and mental institutions. And he was, he came back just scarred really about the conditions of, of the way that, that the people with mental illnesses were treated because they were treated like common criminals or worse. People didn't know what to do with, with them, how to handle them. And so they just sh chained them away and shackled them, um, didn't feed them, put them in cells, um, treated them like criminals, but, but worse. And, um, and so he, he spent his whole life espousing what came to be called moral medicine. And he's not the one who invented moral medicine. It was really, the idea came in France. Um, a couple of people there came up with the idea of that these are human beings. They need to be treated like human beings. And maybe even if we can't cure them, at least we can give them some humanity to enjoy life in the best way they can. Um, but maybe we can cure them if we do, if we treat them like, like human beings. So he and 12 other superintendents of different hospitals uh, around the, the country formed the first medical association in the country. Okay. And it was the American Psychiatric Association okay. in 1844. So moral medicine. So as I said, he was scarred by, by what he saw in Pennsylvania and at other institutions. Here's what they said. They were immured in common jails, enduring the privations and suffering. They were chained like beasts half fed, naked, covered with filth and vermin. And this is a picture that you see here of um, a mental hospital in England. And that that was that was a typical, typical way that that people were treated. So he was he was determined that that wasn't what was going to happen at Western State. And he worked with Blackburn, Thomas Blackburn, to to make sure that the grounds were designed and the buildings were designed so that the people had the best chance of um, of making it out of there. So they, there were gardens that they could walk in, that the buildings, uh, every patient had either their own private room or they shared it with one other person. There was an attendant that went with each person all day long. They tried to make them, uh, give them recreation. They had a, they had a bowling alley there, you know, outdoor, outdoor lawn bowling. They had gardens. And if they, if the people were, if they, he said, if they came in with calloused hands, they knew they liked to work, so they would put him out like working in the garden, and he would see them become, begin to come back to life. Um, you know, they would have music and dancing um, and things that that would give them quiet and solitude as well. So um, he said, we should not rest satisfied with simply exhibiting our pity for the insane. We should go further and inquire whether, by a system of moral means, not less extensive than humane, we may not be enabled to eradicate their disease, but restore them again to all the privileges and enjoyments of rational beings. And so, so he rejected the common medical, you know, he rejected, of course, shackling them and restraining them, but he also rejected the things that, the other things that, um, if you know much about medicine in the, in the 19th century, there were things like bloodletting, you know, George Washington and you know, famously was one of the people that they kept bleeding him and bleeding him until, you know, he died. Um, and they, there was things called blistering, you know, that you would, and cupping where you would, you would, you would uh, like take hot cups and put it on you and try to get the, get the, the bad poisons out of your body. They would do purging where they give you stuff to make you throw up or, you know, have severe diarrhea to just purge your body of whatever demons were in there. Um, and then they would, so they would do things like that and, or give you mercury and which made you more insane probably. Um, but, but he rejected all of that. So treatment at Western state under his, his leadership included a balanced and nutritious diet, good personal hygiene, attractive clothing, pleasant private or semi-private rooms, recreational games, landscape grounds for the walking. And they also were allowed to do healthy work in the gardens crafts, sewing, handiwork, and every patient had his or her attendant who was trained to look after the charges in a kindly way as a friend. So it was, it was a totally radical way of, of looking at things. Um, and it, and you know, and, and it, and it worked for the most part. Um, so he said, we shall neither starve them nor torture them into reason. We treat them as human beings deserving of attention and care rather than as criminals and outlaws. So, um, that was the moral medicine that came to Western State and made it an asylum. Um, and here, here was by 1871, and 
Um, Stribling was there until 1873. He died in that year. Um, this is this is the grounds of Western State. I mean, it was meant to be gardens where visitors could come in, where the patients could walk and play games and enjoy it and have carriageways and walkways. So it was kind of a picnic grounds. They, you know, they planted the the willows. Actually, the willows probably were planted in the 20th century, but carrying on this the same kind of grounds. But that's that's an amazing that's an amazing thing. And still just outside of Stanton. Um, it wasn't really in the city. It's in the city now, but it wasn't then. Um, so an interesting partnership, friendship developed between um, um, Francis Stribling and Dorothea Dix. Probably a lot of you have kind of vaguely heard of Dorothea Dix, um, but she was she was from New England. She had a, um, a terrible childhood. She actually endured uh, both physical and mental breakdowns herself in her life and then kind of survived those and she became a nurse. She was famously a nurse during the Civil War. Um, but her calling in life was to help the the mentally ill and not just the mentally ill, but the indigent mentally ill, the ones who had no money and wound up in these poor houses, um, you know, who had no advocates. And so she traveled like 10,000 miles around the country trying to seek out these places and create. She was a reformer. She got a lot of state legislatures to change what their what their institutions were like. She even actually got the um, the whole country to got Congress to pass an act to put put aside like a million acres of land for these mental institutions all over the country. And President Miller Fillmore vetoed it. So um, so they. They because they both were advocates of moral medicine, they developed a correspondence and then they visited back and forth, visited each other's families. Um, and and many times, and it was it was an interesting friendship and professional relationship as well. And so, you wonder why there's a picture here. You see something that looks like a kind of early slide projector, and people projecting something on the walls. She was always often finding things and sending them, like little recreational things, sending them to to Francis Stribling so that he could share it with the patients. Um, and so he he she sent them a stereoptica, which was is one of those things where you look in and it's those postcards you put in. And if you look at it, they, they look like they're 3D. She sent one of those. And then she sent this new newfangled thing called the Magic Lantern. And this is the that's a Magic Lantern there. And it's like it's an early it's an early slide, you know, slide projector. Um, and because she said some of the patients can't get out, but they have this entertainment, bring it to them. And so. So it was a it was a wonderful correspondence between the two um, that and and Francis Stribling wrote to her in a letter once and said the patients often mention you. They they really loved her and, you know, the, the things that she sent for them. <clears throat> so speaking of the Civil War, that that's you can't talk about that in the Shenandoah Valley. You can't talk about anything in the Shenandoah Valley that it was in existence without mentioning what you know, what happened during the Civil War. And Western State was pretty much spared except for one instance I'm going to tell you about. But, you know, they they had to work hard to make sure there was enough food for the patients. Um, they had to make they they made took care that they took in all their laundry at night so it wouldn't get stolen. And the, the uptick of of uh, people being admitted um, rose dramatically. Um, and here's here's um, a couple of them. One man, a Gordonsville man was admitted after the enemy destroyed his farm, killed his livestock, and treated himself and the family very badly. He said since that time he has attempted suicide and he wound up as a patient at Western State. Um, and it's another man, it talked about that he was in he was in Lexington, he was laying in a stupor, and it said the war is a probable cause of his insanity. So um, so there were there was an increase in patients. And then on March 4th, 1965, when um, when Sheridan was was coming through um, right at this very almost at the end of the war. With this is within you know six weeks of the end of the war, or less. Um, there was a raid in Stanton, and and they came through, and they um, and Bill Miller's been researching this because they Stribling asked him not to take anything. Said the patients need this, and please don't take anything. But they ended up they didn't enter any of the patient buildings, but they took 180 barrels of flour, about 10,000 pounds of bacon, 300 bushels of corn, a considerable quantity of eggs, 
135 bushels of grain, three mules, wagons, harness. And this is the interesting thing, 50 pairs of shoes and wearing apparel from the laundry. So Bill Miller um, has been looking into this. He's, he's going to write up something, I think, for the Historical Society Bulletin. Because what he's realized, because they didn't really go in and destroy the buildings or really, they, the, uh, the Union Army had picked up about 50 prisoners Confederate prisoners who were by this time were in rags, didn't have any shoes, didn't have anything. And his conjecture is they just needed this to feed those prisoners and put shoes on their feet and clothes on them. So it really wasn't a raid to destroy Western state. It was it was to try to help the prisoners that they had just picked up. But we'll find out more about that um, soon. But he's been he's been working on that. Um, so. After Stribling dies in 1873 and that plunges Western state into a a, a big change. Um, moral medicine is kind of out and more institutional medicine uh, is in. And so the patient load rises and they still, you know, this is still a hundred years before we had any kind of pharmaceutical uh, relief for people with, with mental illnesses. So, and, and and people found that Western state was a good place to to unload their family members who weren't living with them anymore. Um, so that the patient numbers, remember Stribling and Blackburn said 420 was the most you could ever have at the hospital. That was that was the max. Well, it was 600 in 1889. It was 1,350 in 1924. Um, and then there was a couple different superintendents and then Dr. Benjamin Black, Blackburn kind of went in and stabilized things. But he also... He's the one that changed the name to the mental uh, to the Western State Hospital, um, and he also is the one who's responsible for now instead of patients having their own rooms, it was dormitory style, and restraints were back. And the restraint that you see here is called a Utica crib, um, and because it, it was perfected in Utica, New York, um, but they that's if someone was violent, they they put them in there and closed it like a crib so they couldn't move. Um, so, so it became a, a different place and, and, uh, members, he still has to report to the general assembly. He has to make sure he doesn't go in the hole financially and, 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 but also take care of these people. So he, he kind of moaned that, uh, in 1898, that too many people used the hospital as an easy means of ridding themselves of relatives who becoming mentally enfeebled by age are regarded as a burden and foisted upon the state for care and protection. So it, that's just. You know, it's also indicative of sort of changes in as society became not a rural society where, you know, you have the whole nuclear family. And when your family gets old, they kind of stay there in the house. We industrialized, people moved to cities and the nuclear family kind of broke up. So so <clears throat> that was what we entered the, the 20th century with that sort of mentality. And then we have the one that y'all all wanted to talk about, <laughs> Dr. Joseph DeJarnett, who was there. He, he had the longest serving, he's the longest serving superintendent in the history of Western State, 1905 to 1943. He actually was, he and his future wife, Chertsey, um, that's, that's her name, were both doctors. She was one of the earliest female physicians around, were both doctors on Dr. Blackford's staff. Um, and then um, Blackford died and <clears throat> uh, DeJarnett became in charge and Churchy promptly resigned and married him um, because it wouldn't have looked good because a female doctor it just wouldn't work so she basically is a marriage of convenience and so that she could continue being a, a doctor there <clears throat> he did a DeJarnett did a lot of of uh, progressive things um, and the, the state loved him because he he turned Western State into a really money-making operation. We're going to talk about that with, with the farming that happened there. Um, you know, and he, he, he was progressive in some things. Like he said, I believe where women do the same work as men, they should receive equal pay. Well, that's, that's pretty liberal. Um, he created separate buildings. He, he was, you know, on the cutting edge of a lot of medical things. Um, he, he did away with a lot of the restraints. Um, he, he created separate buildings, understanding germs and infection. Now he took, made rooms that were separate for people with tuberculosis. He purchased the first x-ray machine. Um, and so 
he did a lot of things that were at the forefront, but he was certainly a man of the era of the time period. And Virginia was in the midst of, in the early 20th century, Virginia, the one thing that that the history books are acknowledging now is Virginia was in the middle of Jim Crow segregation. And he was very much, it was very much, you know, what the General Assembly did. Um, you know, was a guy named Walter Plecker, if you've ever heard of him, who was um, head of the Virginia Vital Statistics from Augusta, from Augusta County. He's Augusta County native, we have to admit. Um, and um, he he's the one that pushed through the Virginia's Racial Integrity Act in 1924 and went through and and basically told people, you know, you're white, you're black, you're colored. You, you can't go to this school. You can't go to this school. The movie Lo Loving versus Virginia came out of all of that. And so the Shenandoah Valley was enmeshed in that. Um, you know, this was the time period where Jim Crow had its height. Um, Plecker was part of um, <clears throat> these white supremacist um, societies that were created in Virginia. Um, and they were also trying to purge any Native American and the Native Americans exactly from that yeah. that happened at the same time. So so and it was it was what Virginia was doing across the state and DJ was right in there in the middle of it. So it, what happened was they all espoused eugenics, which is sterilization of someone's if someone is not up to your your standards of racial integrity. And so, you know, in in Stanton, there was, um, you know, there were several white supremacist groups that were pretty open and and, you know, filled the pages of the newspaper, you know, just lauding them. And, you know, this is the same time when when Stanton changed its from Stanton High School to Robert E. Lee High School to Stonewall Jackson Elementary School because the United Daughters of the Confederacy came and asked the school board to do this. So this is all part of the thing. And and DeJarnett was part of Virginia's and Stanton's society that that was all enmeshed in that. And so that becomes the, the dark side of what was happening. There, there were also some modern, there were a lot of sort of modern therapies that were happening in the 20th century that we wouldn't consider so modern now. Lobotomies um, started kind of at the end of, of um, DeJarnett's career. Lobotomy, those are some lobotomy tools there that we've got on display at that um, they were Western state ones, and lobotomy is they they just take that that pick and with a little hammer and they they put it right in here and apparently just hammer it in so that it punches your frontal lobe there and and calms you down. I I know a person who worked at Western State in the in the fifties, and he said that you could tell when the physician came through and did the lobotomies because. You know, the, those patients who were who were violent, they'd line them up and they'd come out very calm and then they'd all have black eyes the next couple of days from it. So um, and then then the in the 50s, the electroshock therapy, they thought they could shock you back into. So so DeJarnett was experimenting with all that. Um, so he was doing some real good things with X-ray machines and tuberculosis and germ theory. And then he was doing these things. He 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 was obsessed with trying to cure insanity which that's a good thing but um but doing things like if someone's manic depressive so they have these highs and they have these lows what he thought might work is he when they were on their high he'd draw some blood from them and then when they were on the crashing low then he'd put that blood in back in them um to try to mix it and balance it and then when they were low he'd pull some back out and and try to put it in when they were on the high. So there's some wacky stuff, but it was all accepted medical science at that time. So I'm trying to say it's very unsavory now. It's it's the wrong side of history, but it was it was what was happening. So eugenics is the darkest cloud. Um, and the, here's and and he was right in the middle of it. And he he there's no doubt that he thought that what what Hitler was doing in Germany to sterilize people was a good thing. I mean, he made statements for that. He said, in my opinion, the most humane and practical methods of handling the unfit is sterilization. Sterilization, unlike segregation, would not interfere with the individual's liberty and pursuit of happiness. So, so he thought that if they were unfit, the best thing to do would be to sterilize them so that they wouldn't, wouldn't um, reproduce. And so he... Um, he even and the General Assembly thought that was great. And and so 
he he wrote a poem. This is the poem, um, and it's called Mendel's Law. You know, Mendel was the guy, the monk who figured out, you know, how to make, they, he worked with peas and, you know, figured out genetics and, you know, DNA basically, and what can breed to what to create what. So he had this long poem and he said, oh, you wise, this is the end of it. Oh, you wise man, take up the burden and make this your loudest creed. Sterilize the misfits promptly. All are not fit to breed. Then our race will be strengthened and bettered and our men and our women be blessed. Not apish, repulsive, and foolish, for the best will breed the best. So that just turns your stomach today. Yeah. But it didn't then, um, sadly enough. Um, but it it is not, we don't hide it. It's part of this story. Um, and, and it's part of this story that that we're telling it and trying to, to you know, the arc always moves forward. Sometimes there's, back, here, you know, steps backwards and forwards, but trying to move away from that. But we have to understand it. Um, and so the other interesting thing about DiGiorno, because he was he was um, obsessed with running an operation that was going to make money for the state. And one of the things there was always there were always gardens and farm, you know, garden, vegetable gardens and flower gardens at the hospital that always helped with the diet of the people. Um, and as the patient numbers grew, that grew. But DiGiorno in his time period, took it from something that's going to feed his 3,000 patients to a profit-making venture. Um, and in fact, in, let me see, I've got this here, at the peak of, you know, like in the in the early 40s, DeJarnett's farm operation, Western State's farm operation, was the largest farm in Augusta County, 1,600 acres. And in, in 1943, the last year that DeJarnett was there, the farm made a profit, a profit of $25,000, which today is $439,000. A lot of farmers would like to make that kind of profit. Um, and this is this is what the farm had at that time. 5,000 fruit trees, 700 grapevines, 1,500 blackberry and raspberry bushes. It was supplying meals for all of Western State and excess fruit to the Virginia deaf and the blind and to the public. Um, and so in, in 1929, the Apple uh, the hospital realized a profit of $9,300 on apples alone. So they had this huge orchard. You can see the apple crates there. And if you look closely, Stanton's misspelled. But um, <laughs> so, and the picture, the picture on the far left is DeJarnett standing in a, a, a field of peas. They had a huge dairy herd, a huge dairy herd. Um, and the barns that were built in the 1930s are now the barns at the Frontier Culture Museum. Mm -hmm. Because that was part of Western State's farm, and um, and then the the pamphlet that you see, it all came crashing down. Dejarnet was gone, but in the in the late 1950s, it all came crashing down um, for a couple reasons. One is the state couldn't be in competition with private dairy farms. You know, the state was selling milk cheaper than the dairy farmer, and that's not right. Um, but also, essentially, all the patients were being used as slave labor. Um, and that's not right either. And there was a law passed against it. So they had to just, you know, sell the herd and, and everything like that. So they went out of the, the main farming business after that. So, but it, that was, it, it, it was literally the largest farm in Augusta County. <clears throat> they had bacon, they had beef, they had mutton, they had poultry. Um, okay, so another thing I want to talk to you about with the Jarnet. And this one, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Everybody who's gone into Stanton, they see these buildings, right? And they're just there and they're standing empty and they think it's they're haunted and people come and try to find ghosts there and spirits there. And they think that um, all the sterilizations happen there. Um, Western State, during during DeJarnet's time, there were about 1,800 sterilizations. Uh, and DeJarnet oversaw about almost 700 of those. So it was, it was a real thing that was happening, um, but it wasn't happening here. Because this is another, DeJarnet is another one of his money-making schemes for the state of Virginia. And they loved him for it. So what he thought is, hey, you know, we, we get a lot of the poor, the indigent people who are at our mental institution. But we also have, there are a lot of rich people out there who have mental problems. A lot of rich people who are alcoholics or opium users or, or things like that. And they can pay for better treatment. 
And so he built this as the private for pay place for the rich people. It was Dijarnet Sanatorium. And there, there were no sterilizations here. There were no, there were no Utica cribs. They had a golf course. They had a dining room with tablecloths. They had tennis courts. This was, this was the rich people's, um, if you went, if, if grandma had a little problem with nipping too much at the bottle, that's where she went. She didn't go to Western State. So, so then when, when that was shut down eventually, and, and the state loved it because it made lots of money. When it was shut down, it became um, a children's a home for children with, with emotional problems. It's now the, the Commonwealth of Virginia's Children's Center across the road near the interstate. But so it became DeJarnett School for, for children. So there were no sterilizations there or torture or anything like that. There were in that, you know, at times in the 20th century, in the place across from Wright's Dairy Wright, and a little bit, because by the 1940s, the the original campus was being outgrown. Um, when, you're, when you're warehousing 3,000 people in these buildings, it was being outgrown. And so, um, so they, they needed to expand, and so they found ground um, near near um, what became, there was no interstate at that time, but kind of out near um, near the inter what's now the interstate. And they started building there in the 1940s a different kind of campus because they now had this new thing called the automobile and you could you could drive there. And so it was it was more of a college campus dormitory style rather than these these old buildings. Um, and they started in the 1940s. They kind of got bogged down about 1960, so they gradually moved people over, um, or they would bus them from the old campus to the new place during the day where they would do some kind of vocational trades, crafts, and things like that, and then they bus them back. They didn't really complete, the, the transition took from the 1940s till the 1970s to get them totally transitioned over to the new, the new place, which is not the new place anymore, that's all been torn down, but, and then in the 1970s, once they shut down the original campus, then it became, for a while, it became a um, a prison. It was a prison for the older prisoners. It wasn't it wasn't like a high security place. It was for the the older prisoners who were going to finish out their life um, in <clears throat> in prison there. So it became a prison for a few years, and then um, and then in let's see if we've got yeah. So this was. This was the original campus in 1929, right along Route 11. Um, Wright's Dairy, right? Wasn't there yet. Um, and these are some of the old buildings. Um, and then, and then in the the night the 2010s, um, by the 1970s, there were there were drugs that could help people. So the the human warehousing kind of disappeared, and by by the 2000s, there were only a couple hundred patients there, as opposed to 3,000, you know, in the 1940s. Because for two things, one is the laws changed so that it, you were encouraged to get people back into society and back home, and you could do that when you had the right kind of drugs that could help the chemical imbalances in your brain. So the campus and the so you had these big empty buildings at the at the second campus that was built. So they they shut that down. Um, and in 2014, 15, um, they, they started building where the current is kind of on beyond. You go Frontier Drive and keep going. It's kind of beyond what where the second campus was. And they started building that. And that's when Catherine Brown and I got involved in this because they, they said in this new in this new place, um, we're going to have a small room. It's it's. You could fit four of those rooms in this room at least. So it's a very small room. And we want to have a little history room so that people who are here and staff members can can understand the whole story. And so that's when we became involved in and started creating these. You can see there's there's one. Let me, well, I'll flip to some others. But um, so we did these panels and these stories that I'm telling you about are are displayed on the panels. One of the panels is about on um, the cemetery that's there. The hospital opened in in uh, 1828. Within four months, one of the patients had died and they needed and, and no family to claim the body, so they needed to find a burial place. So they started burying people 
right away. But the first burial grounds weren't where you see the big cemetery today. They were on Richmond Avenue. There's still a small cemetery. I don't know if you've seen it. It's kind of where Statler Boulevard comes down into Richmond Avenue. It's kind of in there. There's a small cemetery there um, for the oldest ones. And then, then they then they started burying them at the at the original campus, all up the hill. If you go, you, sometimes if you're coming on Sears Hill in Stanton and it snowed. And you're coming down Sears Hill and you look at the old campus, you can just see that the tombstones are standing out in the, you know, in the white and just hundreds and hundreds of them. There's probably about there's about 3000 graves. And um, and so a lot of times, sometimes when you died, um, you know, the family came in and got your body. But most of the time, you know, if you're from Gordonsville or Charleston, West Virginia or somewhere like that, they're not going to come and get your body They're You're going to be buried right there. And so the old stones are marked and that but then but then privacy laws came into being and and they so it became kind of a uh, almost an assembly line and what they did is um so the big stone on the right that's an old stone uh, from the old cemetery with with name on it but then um then if you if you look on the bottom left that's a mold and they started um with privacy laws, they just gave them a number. This is patient 432. And they poured it in concrete, and they all looked the same, just like the bottom, the middle picture on the bottom, and then there would be a number on it. So um, it, it's all mapped out. So you could, if you can prove that you're a relative of someone, you can go find out exactly where their, their grave is. Um, so here's the, the second campus that was built. Um, that's now been torn down is now Stanton Crossing and they're doing um, other commercial development there. And then here's the, the place that opened in 2016 that has our little history room in it. Um, so we did a timeline and um, put a few artifacts like that big register is there, DeJarnett's briefcase is there, Stribling's cane is there. Um, the collection at the university at not the university the collection at the library of Virginia for Western state is, I think the largest collection in the library. Um, it's massive um, because it, there had to be a yearly report. There had to be, you know, all your agricultural, you know, all your crop statistics, all your patient statistics. Um, That's in Richmond. It's in Richmond. Yeah. But yeah. the library of Virginia for the most part, um, the, Western State actually had their own archive area with a lot of artifacts and things. Um, but then when they moved to the new campus, they, I think they shipped them all to Richmond, except for what we pulled out for the little exhibit. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course the original campus um, was one of the first um, set of buildings to be put on Virginia's uh, register of historic places. And it's, it's on the register and it's been updated. It's an, it's an actually the buildings are amazing buildings. And they've been purchased, and this is a what you're seeing there is the main building, and it is a, a a hotel. Some of the other buildings are apartments, condominiums, but they're gradually restoring all of the buildings. Um, and this is the sort of the Blackburn Conference Center complex now. And that is all that about Western State. I'm sure you got lots of questions about that or um, the Woodrow Wilson complex but it's a fascinating story and i and i what bothers me sometimes is this amazing story of this amazing place gets superseded by the ugly stuff that happened with the jarnet which certainly is we need to talk about and is really a, a, a black eye on the whole story but it's not the whole story yeah. and the, the whole the whole thing about moral medicine i think is an amazing story of you know rejuvenation and and humanity so questions I was once told that the fence, that the iron fence uh -huh. that was put around, was back when it was the asylum or the, you know, mm -hmm. caring place, and that it was actually put around because Victorians liked to picnic, and that the city, the townspeople were coming into the grounds and picnicking and disturbing the patients. So they actually put the fence, not to keep the patients in, but to keep the public out. And they, 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 I'm not sure about that. There, it was put up in the 1850s, and I know that there was a lot of interaction. When my father grew up in Stanton, so this this would have been in the in the 40s. Um, 
the 30s and the 40s, um, there was a lot more interaction with Western state for the for the people who were there, of course, this was still before there were the drugs to get people back in, into society. So, so there were people who were who were nonviolent characters, and they would just walk the streets of Stanton. My father told me there was one who thought he was a judge, and he would just walk all day in Stanton and then go back to sleep at, at Western State. And there was another man who dressed like a woman and just walked around the town all day. And they just the town, they were just part of the town's life, just like the students from VSDB and students from Mary Baldwin and students from, from Stuart Hall were all just part of the town's life. And it has all gotten more segregated now, you know, and everybody has their own little silos, but but it was just part of the life of of the town. So it could be, I mean, I think it was it was sort of a picnic area with the before they widened Greenville Avenue, and I can remember then when they moved the fence back and took down about half the willow trees, and everyone was like, oh, this is just terrible. It was a kind of a a, a beautiful grounds. Yes, back here. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Well, 1828 to 1836 when okay. Francis Dribbling came. Do you know where these people were from? Yeah, um, so you're going to find some records in in the Western State Archives in the Library of Virginia, but also if you if you because there's been a little bit written ab about him, uh, I shouldn't have dismissed him so much, but but he <laughs> boys was the first. Okay, so so if you go to the Augusta County Historical Society website, which is www.augustacountyhs, so that's hs for historical society, not high school. dot uh, <laughs> org. And on the front page, you're going to see a blue icon that says Augusta Community Portal it has a little keyhole. If you click on that, um, and then you'll go to a whole bunch of things that we have online. And if you go to our bulletins, our bulletin is our annual journal, and we've got 95% of those scanned. Um, but so there's two things: the bulletins themselves are there scanned, but there's also you'll see bulletin indices, and they're there's so many of them because we've been putting them out since 1963. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's like 1963 to like 85 and then 85 to, you know, 2000 and then 2000 to now. And you look up boys, they're gonna, you're going to find it mentioned in several articles. And then you can, you can, it'll say, it'll say the, the bulletin to go to. And then you can go and find that bulletin online and find the article. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. And if you have any questions, I've got some cards. You can email me and I can kind of walk you through it. And in, in doing genealogy, I found death certificates of relatives who died in, in uh, Western State. Mm -hmm. um, they, they died of natural causes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because uh, they were there for the rest of their life. Well, like one was there for just 16 days and then she dies. I mean, could, were people there for like Alzheimer's or? Yeah, there were people there for, for every, you saw what they were there for, yeah. menopause. Um, um, inhaling tobacco smoke but yeah they for all variety of reasons and some were there for for decades and decades you know they just never were able to go home there were also periodic times where um you know like in the 1918 flu swept through there and and a lot of them died of the of the influenza or or consumption you know more people died of tuberculosis than anybody else in the united states for most of our our history um yeah, so it could have been a variety of, of reasons. Oh, is there a place to go and actually look at the patient's records? Yeah, yes. You and you gotta do it through contact Western State. I think on their website there's a way to, to get in there, but you've got to prove that you're a relative. And then they can they can open them up to you. And they can even um they can even they've got a big map and they can even if you find them, they're buried there, you can you can even, you know, they'll take you out to the row and show you where it is. There's a couple of people in particular who are really good at knowing where everybody's buried. And these folks are sitting back to Shenandoah County, but yeah. So follow up on that. So the records for each particular grave site and who's buried there is it the hospital or in the state archives in Richmond? The hospital. There, there's. I know there's at least one employee at the hospital who kind of has the map and kind of knows where it is. But I would call the hospital to start with and just. Make an inquiry with them, and they'll they'll direct you to the right place. I think the records are going to be, for the most part, in Richmond. But the map with where that person is buried, without a lot of the extra materials, 
are going to be through Western State. When they covered over the names on the graves, did the historian? Well, they didn't cover them over. Oh, oh um, so, so they, there's a plate. Over each yeah, and that and that then they just stamp the number. They just it's just a raised area. They didn't oh. cover over. They just okay. So he dies. So we we've got the form. We just pour the cement and it, it the raised part. We just put in the number. He's patient. 1,922. Oh, so there were never graves with <laughs> names on there. there. The earliest ones have names. Yeah, but after, after, um, and I would say from the late 19th century, then they just had those numbers. I'm just curious. Yeah. Why privacy laws. Privacy is given up when you're dead. You can't libel a dead person. Right, but your health records are associated. You're you're buried in a in a hospital. So. So some of the quote unquote privacy laws, especially around state institutions, actually is tied to the eugenics movement. If somebody died in a state institution and it's on record of like, let's say my uncle's buried in that cemetery. And it's listed that he was he was there. And you have to remember with the eugenics movement, there was this idea that if somebody in your family was mentally ill, you also were. And you were tainted, yes. And you didn't so mention it. Finding out, yeah. like, well, you had so and so. Well, I'm not going to marry you. You shouldn't have children. That's part of that. That was why that law was put into place. Well, and then they also to remember that the eugenics mo movement didn't it wasn't just Stanton and, and Western State or just Virginia. It was all across the country. It was like across the world. Across the world, yeah. Yeah, it was across the world. I mean, that's you know, Hitler took it to extreme, but it but he wasn't out of out of step with. The medical world at the time. So then they could put the stone personalized with names. That's exactly right. And in that old the old cemetery, a lot of the stones that are there now were families putting them there later. Like there's a there's a four of 1812 veteran that the family came later and put put a, a stone up there for him. You were gonna say something. I was gonna say that's iron, iron gown. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Always adults. There were any, the people that were. Um, I don't know if there were any children there or not. I don't know that there were many children that were there. I mean, there could have been. There were also, you know, help, help that was there, and and, and people who lived like the superintendents and all. There were would have been children of people who are living, who are not mentally ill, who were living on campus to do the the work. Um, <clears throat> that's another interesting thing. Um, the Civil War. The, the hospital had uh, hired slaves to work. So that was another change that came with the Civil War is then they they had uh, employees rather than slaves that, that worked there. Was the facility desegregated at some point? It was desegregated, but in the 20th century, there was, um, I don't know, Eastern State became the, the African-American you know, hospital for the mentally ill. So um, it was probably... I'm going to guess it was probably in the 60s when Virginia did a lot of, did, but I don't, I don't know that. I'd have, that's easily, easy to find that out, but I don't, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing there. Yes. Um, I would just say there were some children up there because I had worked at Liberty House Nursing Home uh -huh. in the 70s, and that was when Western State was sending patients out that were, you know, stable. And, and we got several people that had been admitted as children. And Interesting. You know, old, you know, old. You know and, and now that I think about it, the 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 big case in Virginia of the the girl who was the um, Buck was her last name that was went to went to the um the epileptic asylum and she was I think very young like thirteen or something. So uh, I maybe also with people who had epilepsy they they went earlier too. Yeah. Yes. There's a connection between the Strimling and Blackford families. Um. The Blackford, not Blackburn, but Blackford. Blackford. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the two said superintendent. Uh-huh. Uh, the little town of Orkney Springs has something called a Stribling Select Cottage. And the mother of Anne Stribling, Sigamunda Stribling, was the first cousin to Francis. Palabario Stribling. Yeah. All right? Yeah. <laughs> this little village, two houses around from that, was the Blackford's summer cottage, Blackford family summer cottage. Um, so they were both Episcopalians, or, so there's some kind of link there. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. Interesting. Here are Springs. You want to come yeah. to Springs? We'll show you around. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> yeah, of course, there was a Stribling Springs in Augusta County. Exactly. Yeah, that was, was that a resort. Or was that, the... that was Erasmus. Yes. Mm -hmm. But Francis was part of the family. Yeah, exactly. Time. Yeah. Well, thank y'all have been great. And y'all, as always, I get more, I learn more from you. <laughs> <laughs>